back to Leaders Recon. It's been a long time coming, but we finally have the Director of the Army National Guard with us, Lieutenant General John Jensen. Sir, welcome to the program. Joshua, thanks, I, I appreciate it. You make it sound like you had to chase me for this, right? It's a long time coming. As soon as you invited me, I came on over, but I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here and really honored to be here. Thanks for, for what you do for our, our, our Army Guard in terms of helping us tell our story, not only internally, but externally as well. Well, talking about telling our story, sir, that's kind of one of the things I wanted to start off with a little bit was, obviously, before we dive into policy and the Army of 2030 and that stuff, just talking a little bit about like, hey, Private Jensen, was that 1982, I believe? 1982, I... November of 82, I enlisted as a combat medic in 1st Battalion, 168th Infantry, Council Bluffs, Iowa. Interesting enough, uh, battalion commander at that time was Lieutenant Colonel Roger Schultz, who later on becomes the director of the Army Guard in the late 1990s and early oh, really? 2000s, and uh, still today serves as a great mentor for, for me. He was, uh, as a matter of fact, he was in the building here earlier this week. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I enlisted, you know, honestly for the college money. Oh, really? Uh, I was a first semester freshman in college. I uh, realized that, uh, you know, I was gonna need to do something to help pay for college. I love being in college. I really didn't have a lot of financial means to, to, to make college happen. And so uh, the Army National Guard gave me a great avenue to, to, to go through to help pay for that. And, you know, like, like a lot of young men and women, you know, when you first enlist, you, you, you can't see it becoming a career. All you can think of is, you know, I'm going to serve my, my term and then get out as soon as possible. And uh, that was uh, soon to be 41 years ago. So that uh, I think that I think they got their money's worth out of me, right? It's six year enlistment, and here I am, almost 41 years later. But served in that battalion for uh, almost 18 years, uh, both as an enlisted soldier and NCO and, and an officer. Well, and that's what I was saying, sir. I know we could kind of read your bio, and and I obviously read it ahead of time of, of this interview, but. You know, was there a transformative experience for you there that, um, you know, kind of pulling back the curtain, obviously we can read the paper version of your assignments, but like, what was that experience where you transformed from wanting to do your time, you know, get get money for college, like you said, to, you know, now you're the director of the Army National Guard? Yeah, I think there's a couple. There wasn't, I think I don't necessarily think that there was just one, but there was a couple, and, and I'll lay a, uh, some of those out. One, when I was promoted to, to becoming a non-commissioned officer, uh, and and I was able to take more of a of a leadership role inside of the organization. I think, you know, that really kind of sparked an interest for me to, you know, continue to serve beyond my my initial six years. And then, you know, my decision to become an officer again, it gave me a different opportunity to to serve in a different in a different way. You know that that allowed me to readjust my goals and maybe refocus uh, goals on something else. And then, you know, I think really the path to becoming the director of the Army Guard really started uh, my decision in, uh, in 2001, 2000, 2001, to attend the School of Advanced Military Studies. Oh, okay. uh, because that made a lot of other things possible. As a result of my attendance at SAMS, I had to go to a division headquarters, which forced me to go uh, to, to Minnesota, where the 34th Infantry Division was. So a new state, a new experience. Um, and then that just, you know, just cascaded from different experience, different opportunity to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And so, you know, I find myself here, you know, as I said, almost 41 years after enlisting uh, really uh, as surprised as anybody is that, uh, you know, I'm sitting in that office. Speaking of that, sitting in that office and kind of, I guess, going back to what we were going to talk about here was a little bit about like your priorities and what you see kind of for the Army of or National Guard of 2030. You know, what would you say are your primary priorities or objectives or vision for the Army National Guard of 2030 right now? I mean, obviously, we share the the same priorities of the Chief of the National Guard Bureau simultaneously, you know, linked with the Chief of Staff of the Army. So when I came in as the director, it was it was pretty simple, right? General McConville, General Hokinson, people uh, and readiness were were two of their really strong focuses. And, and so, you know, we, we, we took those on. Uh, as well, and and while 
they have those two remain our 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 primary focus because in part you can put a lot of things underneath those i would tell you that that primarily what i really focus my efforts on uh every single day really is recruiting and then strength okay and and trying to bring a different approach as it relates to readiness inside of the army national guard following you know, over two decades of support to the global war on terrorism and the Army's refocus on large-scale combat operations in a multi-domain environment. And how are we going to do that? Because I felt like our approach to GWAT was not going to be successful as we as we changed our focus to large-scale combat operations. So those are the two things that consume most of my my thinking and most of my thought process. Uh, I mean, obviously, I do a lot more than that, but I, I would tell you that's that's where I'm currently focused as the director. So, I guess going through those, uh, starting with your initial priorities, people and readiness, right? We hear, or I've heard a lot about. You know, I feel like every senior leader I've I've ever heard give a speech or something says, like, people is our priority. You know, what are some of the, right, what are some of the like, I guess, focus points that you would say, like, how do you, or what is your plan to get after, you know that objective of people um, and what does that look like over the next couple of years? Yeah. Well, Joshua, I think if you, if you go back to what you, how you started, this is that, you know, every time I hear a senior leader talk about, you know, talk, they talk about people. I think that's because as, as you grow into the organization, mature in the organization, you really be able, you, you really begin to see the army, uh, the centerpiece of the army as, as our soldiers, uh, our people, uh, our army families, our army civilians, and for the reserve component as well, is our employers. And you really see how of a people-centric organization the United States Army is. And and you really begin to see and value the contribution that every soldier uh, makes as part of their unit. Now, it's not to say you don't see it as a, as a younger officer, let's say as a younger officer, but I think your focus is just in a in a different way, uh, in a different approach. And you know, when you're a company grade officer, many times you're leading for today. The more senior you become in an organization, you lead for tomorrow. And so it's about the investment of uh, of the organization. And so for me, uh, you know, the way I was professionally raised, I, I go back to General Schultz, as I mentioned in my opening discussion uh, of how my career began. But you know, he he really instilled in me, as did many other leaders later, the importance of, of end strength. You know, how do we, how well do we man our units? It's, the, you know, the, the old story, you can't train a vacancy, you can't deploy a vacancy. And, and so when I first came in as the director, uh, my first sit down with both General Hokinson and General McConville at that time, uh, he was the chief staff of the Army, really talked to him about I felt that my first obligation to the Army and my first obligation to Congress is to ensure we meet our end strength uh, objective. Uh, and, you know, that was that was a little bit easier to do uh, pre-COVID than, than it has been coming out of COVID. So we've had a real strong approach as it relates to uh, what programs can we change that can impact our ability to recruit talent and retain talent. So we've done a couple of things. For example, one of the things we did uh, a couple of years ago is for a reenlistment bonus, instead of, instead of having anniversary payments, we just do a lump sum uh, bonus, for example. And so we're always tweaking that system, trying to figure out, you know, how can we spend our, our money and, and get the largest reward, the reward being the enlistment or the retention of, 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 of one of our soldiers. We've done a lot of work as it relates to federal recognition. When I came in, uh, we were having some issues related to uh, federal recognition, and we've been able to in, uh, decrease the amount of time it takes for us here in the building to really respond to those to those requests. Student loan repayment's been uh, an issue that we've had to work our way through as well. So really a lot of focus when we talk about people on on how do we get how do we fulfill the promises that we make? So we assess a soldier or we retain a soldier. There's usually some type of promise made by the organization to the soldier, whether that's an enlistment bonus, whether that's a student loan repayment, 
something like that. And and we've really tried to focus on how can we more better provide that service to the to the soldier. What would you say then, sir, is what or what would be your advice to leaders at esch- at all echelons and like how they support that vision that you're getting after there with, you know, basically fulfilling those promises to soldiers? And yeah, I I think I think a lot of it is you know number one is uh, un- understand the programs that are out there, and I'll give you a, I'll give you a great example. So today. Major General Dale Lyles, the Adjutant General of Indiana, and Major General Tom Cardin, the Adjutant General of Georgia, uh, they they chair and vice chair uh, my recruiting and retention readiness advisory council. Uh, and one of the things that we were talking about was reenlistment bonus and the impact of a reenlistment bonus in the blended retirement system. And this this concept, this idea of continuation pay and don't do what do we know as as leaders of the organization what continuation pay is and the the impact that that has on soldiers and the impact that it might have on retention bonuses so for example we used to really focus on 6 year reenlistment bonuses cuz we felt that if we could get a soldier to 12 years of service that their probability to serve to 20 years was very high well with continuation pay you don't really need to get the soldier necessarily to 12 years for them to make that decision, that that decision very well comes earlier uh, in their career, maybe at the nine-year mark. And so instead of trying to get the soldier to 12, maybe the key is how do we get them to nine years? So so that's just my example about you have to understand the programs that are out there. And those programs you don't understand, at least know who the people are inside of your organization, whether that's at the Joint Force Headquarters or your higher command, whoever that is. Who can I turn my soldier over to that will be able to answer their question? And I know that's really hard because our programs change year to year. Programs get added, they get deleted. But I think I think the most important thing is 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 understand what services we have out there for soldiers. And that is just not incentives and benefits, but but also, you know, we've worked really hard on resiliency uh, for quite some time. And, and, and that program has changed multiple times over the, over the course of, let's just say, the last 10 years. So understanding what resources are available for our soldiers and for our families, I think, is really critical. And, and if a soldier or if a leader can understand that and then also have what I think is really important is have a view to the future and that we'll, we want to invest into our soldier because if we invest into our soldier, they have a higher probability to be there in the future. And so while what we're doing today is very important, down the road might be more important. So, you know, you know, we, we struggle with this a lot about, well, you know, do I send my soldier to NCOES or do I send my soldier to NTC? Well, I will say NCOES over NTC every time because that's an investment into that soldier. That's a direct investment into that soldier. There very well are going to be other opportunities for them to go to a CTC, but getting that soldier to NCOES at the right time sets them up for future success. Well, that leads right into another question I was going to ask you, sir, and that is like, you know, with this shift to, you know, a a more peacetime environment where the operational op tempo has decreased a lot, you know, what are your thoughts on how... The Army National Guard gets after leader development when you don't have those mobilization opportunities that we had for the past 20 years that were more like leader development crucibles, I, you know, I'd say. Yeah, I think those opportunities will still exist in the Army National Guard. We we currently have about 23,000 soldiers that are deployed in sh- some shape, form, or fashion, another 11,000 that are on duty at their state. So there are those those events are still going to take place. And, and, and you're right, they, they provide a great experience, right, to really grow uh, uh, as a leader. But I think the other things that we, the other thing that we have to do is we have to take full advantage of the opportunities that exist out there. Let's just take our combat training center rotations, right? What, what, I, what I saw was we were sending brigades uh, to Fort Johnson, uh, Louisiana, and to Fort Irwin, California at, 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 you know, strength of 65%, 70%, 75%. And, and, and so an organization that goes at 75% strength, we're missing 25% of the opportunity. And, and quite frankly, even more than that, because when you think about if 
I add 25% more soldiers, I can get actually after more things at a higher echelon. So there's even more things I could do. And so we've worked really hard to create these, this readiness partner concept where as we send in one brigade to a CTC, we're also simultaneously identifying units from outside of that brigade to come augment the brigade so that brigade can come at a much higher uh, manning percentage. And, and when you do that, one, more soldiers get that opportunity. But again, through the synergy of, of full organizations, you're able to achieve a higher level of proficiency. So therefore, you get more opportunity uh, to do more complex and harder things. And so I think one of the keys here, and that I'm asking all of our leaders to do, is identify where those opportunities are and take full advantage uh, of those opportunities. So that kind of bleeds into, you know, what we, you had talked about before is another priority being readiness. Um, I was reading a little bit about this, like, kind of generational readiness concept. What is that? Yeah, it, it it's kind of this, you know, as I, I mentioned, you know, the way that we approached readiness during GWAT has got to be different than, than our approach now as we approach large-scale uh, combat operations. And, and, and the example I use is, is a field artillery battalion that during GWAT gets a mission to be a security battalion. Now, this isn't to take away uh, anything from any soldier that deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan or elsewhere during that time. I mean, I'm one of those soldiers, right? And so I'm not discounting our contribution. I'm not discounting uh, the sacrifices that, that we made and certainly not discounting uh, the loss of life uh, that, that we incurred as well. But our experience in GWAT was we could take a field artillery battalion and really somewhere between 60 to 75 days turn them into a, a very uh, proficient and a very successful security battalion. Well, you can't flip it the other way. You can't take a security battalion in a matter of 60 to 75 days, create a lethal field artillery battalion. The skills and the requirements and the coordination, the synchronization that, uh, that that battalion has to be proficient at are significantly uh, more complex than the previous missions that we were getting. And that it takes really effectively a generation for a unit to truly become proficient at its wartime tasks that we'll need for large-scale combat operations. You know, the modern battlefield is is more lethal today than it than it ever has been. And you know, you know, Joshua, like you and like a lot of your listeners, you know, when we we look at what we're learning in in Ukraine between the uh, the war between Ukraine and Russia, and we see that incredibly lethal battlefield. We can see what what happens to untrained or minimally trained units on, on the battlefield. They, they they can't survive. And so, while we'll continue to deploy units and uh, we'll continue to deploy units, maybe in non-standard missions, that can't be our our full focus, right? Our focus has to be on preparing for large-scale combat operations because of the complexity. Uh, of those operations and the lethality associated with those operations. What would you say then would be your advice to leaders once again, like on how, you know, how can they align their training plans focused around readiness to kind of match with this new readiness model? Yeah. So do during GWAT, we had a very transactional approach to readiness. You know, we would, we'd, We'd create these ad hoc units for these non-standard missions. We would create temporary readiness. We would deploy it into theater. They would do their mission. They would come back. We'd break up. And we may or may not go back to our wartime tasks. Some units, you know, they could see the patch chart and they were literally like, well, we know in four years we're going to go back and we're going to do a similar mission. Uh, and so we really lost the focus and the discipline uh, and the understanding about how my unit as part of a larger unit, as part of a larger operations contributes to that. So uh, we can't lose focus that that's the primacy of our time and our development uh, and of our leadership. Uh, because, you know, the nice thing about GWAT in the, in the patch chart is, you know, you could look out on the horizon and see when your unit was coming. 
uh, and you you know this was all kind of pre-planned, and you had the advantage of time. We very well aren't going to have the advantage of time the next time. So so we need to we need to we 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 need to get after this. And so when the army made this change, you know, all of us in the army, you know, shook our heads, said, "Right, we got it." We got this, uh, but it's not quite that simple. I mean, you you've got to you've really got to change our our messaging. You got to change our focus. We got to we got to change you know how we approach things, uh, you know, because during that time of GWAT, we lost a, a a lot of knowledge and a lot of skills uh, because we had to apply our effort and our energy in a different direction, sure. um, and that was okay. That was okay for the time. But now that we're out of that, we've got to we, we've got to get back. And you know, General Garrett, when he was the Force Com Commander, used to talk about mastering the fundamentals. And so, you know, we got to we got to master our fundamentals, but very quickly get through that phase of generational readiness, where where we have this uh, institutional understanding of what those fundamentals are, how to train those fundamentals, and it just becomes habit uh, in terms of how we approach that. We need to get through that phase of this very quickly and then, you know, move into, okay, now we need to ma master, you know, fire and, 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 and maneuver uh, and, and things like that. Where do you see the focus being, you know, at the unit level, right? Like, you know, I, I, I'm just coming out of company command, right? Yeah. And so I think in my cycles, I focused up to like squad level proficiency on most of my, in the two years I was there cause, because of where we were in our cycle. And right. You know, what would be your advice to units as they kind of as they're looking at this generational readiness model and how they get after what their focused audience is and at what echelon are they trying to build proficiency? Well, doctrinally, we know this about the army. You, you train one level down and you validate two levels down, right? Uh, so if you're a company commander, you really need to to focus on okay, how do I train my platoons and how do I validate my squads as part of that? Uh, and so it, you know, it's a fairly s simple model. So if you're if you're a company commander, right, you you should have had some expectation that your battalion commander that was training you, and that your brigade commander or whoever your brigade commander equivalent uh, is was was validating your ability to be a, a, a company commander. So that part of the army really hasn't changed at all. That that that's grounded, you know, training management 101 from, you know, the the mid '90s, when we really kind of developed uh, that concept, and that's still uh, alive and well now. What certainly has changed since you know I was a young soldier uh, during that time is, you know, the enablers that we have, uh, the enablers that may come join our unit, how we fit in with a higher headquarters. That very well has changed a little bit, but as it relates to what our work day to day as a as a leader is, it's it's to train one level down. Uh, validate two levels down. So shifting gears a little bit then, okay. talking about modernization. Um, There's been lots of talk about modernization over the past several years. You know, what does that look like for the Guard, you know, of 2030? And, you know, what are some of the biggest impacts that you think the Guard's going to see over the next few years? Well, I, you know, what's it going to look like? I think if you go back to the last great modernization of the, of the Army in the 1980s, through the 1990s, you know, into that into that uh, first Gulf War, uh, and then into the 2000s as as well as that, you know, modernization isn't a one-time effort. It's not. It's it's not one palm. It's not one FIDAP. You know, it's it it's a couple decades to 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 get to get through this. So what it's going to look like is, you know, as the as the active component or Compo one. Uh, modernizes the reserve component will modernize right along with it. Maybe not at the same speed that it does, uh, but 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 we'll be modernizing like units across the army formation uh, simultaneously. And I would think you know depending on where you're at as a as a young soldier. Let's say let's say you were enlisted as a as a young soldier this month. I think what you're going to expect uh, during your career. Is that you're going to have a couple different uh, modernization touch points during your career. Let's define a career by 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 20 years. Okay. So in the next 20 years, you're going to have four or five modernization touch points during that career. 
where you're going to see some type of uh, modernization inside of, uh, of your force. Now, depending on what kind of force you are, will depend on what kind of that modernization is. However, modernization just isn't our equipment, right? So we're talking about uh, new units and new capabilities. For example, I think the great one to, to, to think about is the multi-domain task force. Okay. You know, a completely different uh, organization inside of the Army. Uh, you know, what you know, what new capability is that is that going to bring? Or how about theater information advantage detachments, right? Uh, different capability, different focus. We'll continue to have infantry units. We'll continue to have army units, field artillery, uh, you know, special operations, aviation. Those things will exist, but maybe how they're organized might be uh, okay. a, a little bit different. So, so modernization will be more than just a, a, a an equipment. Be be more than just equipment. What are the big modernization efforts that like soldiers you think will see an impact on over the next like five to seven years? Well, right now we have the the two seventh eight two seven eight armor brigade combat team that's going through uh, Bradley modernization. While it's cascaded equipment from the third infantry division, it's a more modern platform than what they have currently. Uh, First brigade thirty fourth infantry division uh, going through that same modernization. AH sixty four echoes. Uh, now in the South okay. Carolina Ar Army National Guard, are, are are examples of modernization that are taking place right now. But if you go a little bit deeper, extended uh, range uh, artillery, ERK A, we know we're gonna it's going to come and replace some of our 155 self-propelled. For example, we have information electronic warfare companies that are coming to the coming to the organization. So those are just some things here in the next. Uh, you know that are ongoing now into into five years down down the road, and how does this play into this term that I feel like I've been hearing more frequently, which is this integrated reserve? You know what what does that mean, and like and how does that work within the total force construct? Well, as you know, as I came in the director, uh, there was you know we're kind of as a transition point uh, for the army, and. While we're still deploying in support of the global war on terrorism, it doesn't really have the same focus as it as it as it once did, and, and so there was this discussion uh, amongst uh, adjutants general uh, that were that had taken place was, hey, what's going to happen to the Army National Guard? You know, we had you know pre nine eleven, we were the strategic reserve. You know, breakout in the in the case of World War Three only weren't really uh, utilized by the, uh, by the Army. Post 9-11 became much more of an operational element of the Army. Well, you know, we're deployed all over the globe. 2005, we were more than 50% of the brigade combat teams in Iraq. And so, the you know, w w really what the Army was asking us to do and how we were being used was completely different post 9-11 from pre 9-11. So the question became, well, if we're leaving Afghanistan, we're leaving Iraq. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna leave these uh, opportunities here. Are we gonna return back to a strategic reserve? Now, this is important because of, because of the budgetary aspects of both of those terms, right? Strategic reserve, the way that we understand that is less funding, less priority, less modernization. You're gonna be put on the shelf. Operational reserve, more funding, more opportunities. And so while that discussion was happening, you know, really what we came about was, hey, we really need a different term to really describe what the Army National Guard is and what it, what it provides the Army. Part of this comes, again, from General McConville when he was chief staff of the Army, said, well, you know, really the Army National Guard is both. It's, it's an operational reserve and it's a strategic reserve depending on what unit you're in and depending on where that unit is in its unit life cycle. And, and, and I think that really kind of captured the way that we need to look at ourselves differently. We're not an operational reserve. We're not a strategic reserve. We're both, but it, can you be both? And so we were looking for a, a new term that better described our contribution to the Army, to our nation, and to our state. And it's integrated reserve is where we're at because we are both operational and a strategic uh, reserve. And so when you look at that, so... What do, what do we mean by operational reserve? Hey, we're, uh, we're supporting, supporting operations uh, throughout the globe, you know, 
Operation Spartan Shield, for example, we're, 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 we're in Europe, we're Indo, PACOM. Strategic reserve, well, what's that strategic reserve mean? Well, it, it's a couple components. It's the force generation or the institutional part of the Army that runs, for example, NCO, NCOES courses uh, at, at our RTIs or, okay. or officer candidate school or RTIs. But it's even deeper than that. It's uh, you know our state partnership program and how those relationships can contribute really to uh, a closer relationship between countries and and the United States and the impact that that has uh, you know as it relates to the to, 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 to deterrence. And then the third part of that, which we don't talk about a lot, but it but it's really kind of interwoven inside the operational reserve is is that in truly to be an integrated reserve, we have to have interoperability with our with our compo one, compo three, our active component in our army reserve. That's really important because just say, for example, if the United States would 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 go to war in Europe, my contention is the United States Army active component, while we'll fight as as a coalition, a multinational, and an, an alliance, the vast majority of soldiers that the, that we'll fight with will be re- United States National Guard and Army Reserve, and that the first element of interoperability you have have to have is inside the United States Army, you know, and then to your sister services, and then to your you know your allies and and, and your partners. So we can't we can't forget that part, and then so when we look at the Look at the whole enterprise, right? Uh, the example I like to give is again back to General McConville. Had an Army National Guard officer who served in his legislative liaison office, and and routinely briefed the chief of staff of the Army. So effectively, we're at the highest level, United States Army. Meanwhile, we have NCOs that are down at the basic training company level, right? That are contributing to that. So as it relates to an echelon of the Army, we're, we're serving at the highest echelon and the lowest echelon of the Army. You look across every combatant command, we're in every combatant command, and you look at every ongoing operation right now, there is, a, there is at least an Army Guardsman there, if not an Army Guard unit there. And so it's this idea that you know the, the total force, the total Army, can't really accomplish its mission without a fully integrated reserve. How does that look? So, you know, you mentioned the funding piece of it a little bit ago. As we go into this kind of, you know, funding constraints that we've been talking about um, at the at the federal level here, what does that look like as an integrated reserve, part of the total force, with funding constraints related to the guard? You know, how do you th- see things changing over the next few years? Well, we're gonna we're gonna benefit from that but we're 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 also going to pay a bill for that and and this is what I mean so here's a benefit right so the army is allocating a larger percent of their budget to modernization right because they 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 fully understand the current operating environment uh, not only today but as they look out uh, into the future and 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 really uh, trying to design the force for 2040 uh, and then put that force uh, uh, on the field uh, you know, so we're gonna we're gonna benefit from those modernization efforts as we as we just as we just talked about, but the army only gets a certain percentage of the budget every year, and so if we're gonna put a larger percentage of the army budget against modernization, there's got to be a cost to that, and so where does that money come from? The ability to to balance our risk as it relates to readiness and as it relates to manning the force as we put forth uh, modernization will be very important for, for all of us to pay attention to and understand why is it uh, that we're, we're making these decisions. I guess, you know, piggybacking off of that, right, you had, you had started with, you joined the Army National Guard um, for college way back in the day. Yeah. You know, what is the recruiting outlook? You said that was what you spent a lot of your time on. You know, what is the recruiting outlook like for the Guard right now? Um, I, I know you kind of talked this, about this at the beginning, but what does that recruiting outlook look like? And then, you know, what would your message be to how leaders in the state can help support that uh, for the Army National Guard? Yeah, so I'll start with that. You know, how can leaders uh, support that? 
uh, first off, they have to make uh, they have to make strength a, strength a priority, right? It has to be uh, has to be our priority. So if you look at uh, let's just let's just assume this: you have a fixed amount of resources. Uh, you're going to go in. You're going to establish your priorities. You're going to you're going to move your resources around to to meet your priorities. Over the course of time, priorities can change a little bit. If you're still going to have a fixed budget, you have to move your resources around again. You just can't stand up and say, "I need more re- resources." Absolutely, we understand that 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 we need more resources. However, without more resources, what you have to do is make sure your resources are aligned to your priorities. And so that's what I'm asking everybody to do at the state level: is align our resources in accordance with what our our, our priority is uh, here. As it relates to fiscal year 23, uh, the, the Army's end strength mission to the Army Guard was 325,000. Uh, all indications right now are we're going to be a little bit above 325,000, so that's good. Uh, and I contribute that to, you know, first off, the great production recruiters and recruiting battalions that, that, that are out there. Um, we're not going to meet 100% of our accession mission, but we're going to be about 96% of our accession mission, and about 5,000 more accessions than last year. So I really think that, you know, we're starting to climb that hill uh, again of, of, of increasing our strength, and it's going to take, you know, it's going to take us a while to climb that that that, that hill. Uh, but the second part that I, I uh, attribute our success this year to is really just our great soldiers, our great units at the unit level, right? And so we're going to meet about 96, 97 percent of our retention mission uh, as well. And so both of those factors have contributed to an environment where we're seeing really the this the steep slide down during 22 and early 23 to begin to reverse. And now what we're going to see is that that steady climb north. But there's two things that we have to do. First of all, we have to mission ourselves to success. Our uh, our enlistment mission this year, our accession mission this year, was 30,880. Quite frankly, that's not enough to sustain the Army Guard, and certainly not enough to grow the Army Guard. So what we're going to see is incrementally we will begin to increase that. We need to get that back uh, up north of 40,000. So it needs to be you know, 42 to 44,000 is really where we want that accession mission to be. And then equally important, as we mission ourselves to success, we have to program ourselves to success with the resources. So as that accession mission moves up, we have to make sure that the resources follow that. So, you know, we, we create the environment where we can be successful. But I'm very encouraged on uh, how 2023 is shaping out and how it's going to end. Uh, and so our next goal is going to be 326 because that's what the Army's assigned us for 24. And so we're going to we're going to very aggressively uh, approach that. And I think, uh, although still a challenging environment, I, I, I think what we'll see is we'll more easily meet the 326 mission uh, next year than we met the 325 mission this year. So I've got a couple more questions for okay. you. One of them is, is like, obviously I've been working up here while also going back and drilling at the company level right um and you just hear grumblings a lot of times in the state on like oh they're they're the the people at the guard bureau don't understand like what yep. we're going through you know how do you get back after soliciting feedbacks from the state yeah. state to inform your decision making process one i'm i'm cognizant of the old army theory theory that says the most screwed up headquarters in the army is the one above you and the one below you right so you know i've you know, you have to have that perspective is, is that, you know, the people are either not going to understand uh, or be unhappy with decisions. So you get that. So um, I think we have a really uh, transparent decision making process here in the Army National Guard and one that allows our adjutants general uh, input into the system. So uh, it, it, it it's a system, quite frankly, we inherited from uh, Lieutenant General retired Tim Cadavy. He created this General Officer Advisory Council, Readiness Advisory Council system. And all I did was take it, modify it a little bit, uh, and then tried to be really ruthless as it relates to the execution of that process. And so we have a series of Readiness Advisory Councils, or RACs, or what we call, call them. 
chaired and vice chaired by adjutants general, almost in every case, there's just a couple of examples where that's not the case, that have other state uh, uh, members of that. And then out of the building, we support that and have mem uh, members on that. And really, I've given those adjutants general and those rack chairs uh, as much leeway to go to go in whatever direction they want to take those advisory councils as it relates to getting after our priorities uh, of the organization. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as as it relates to how then they then they provide feedback uh, through all of our, uh, you know, assistant deputy directors, our deputy director and myself. And ultimately, that leads to what we call the director's decision form every other Thursday, very transparent. Uh, we invite those rack chairs and other adjutants generals to sit in uh, really on the media issues of the Army National Guard. And so, you know, what problems are we trying to solve? What decisions are we making as it relates to, to solving those problems? And so I think it's a very open uh, system. It's a very transparent system that really allows a, a, a lot of input from the states because that's that's really what I felt that, you know, being a previous adjutant general is that all I wanted was input into the decision. The decision maker gets to make the decision, right? And 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 all I want to be able to do is is to be heard. Now, the Army Guard's a very complex organization. So not everybody's a expert on every subject and every topic. And so being able to have people kind of focus in certain areas as a, as it relates to whatever their interests are or what their expertise is, uh, you know, really I think allows me to make better decisions. And and what I have found so far is is even when you make decisions that 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 maybe people don't agree with, the fact that they know that they were able to provide input into it, they're they're more accepting of those decisions. Causes that buy in a little bit. Well, my last question, sir, is if you had to go back and give yourself a piece of advice, you know, 10 or I guess in your case, 20 years ago, you know, what would it be and why? And, and did you have any messages you wanted to kind of share with the force directly? Yeah. So I, I would say if I could give myself uh, two, two pieces of advice uh, 20 years ago, one would be it really is it's all about the people and investing into our people. Uh, and that it's about, you know, how can we better develop our people for the future? Uh, I, I was very fortunate. I, I had people that, you know, took an interest in my career uh, and helped develop me uh, so I was better prepared for the for the next step. And so the second piece of that w would be, hey, look for opportunities to do something maybe a little bit different. There's no one path to success. No matter how you define success, there's not one path. And so you might you might have a mentor or somebody that, that you were like, hey, I want to be like like them because, you know, where they ultimately went, that's what I want to do. But understand you don't have to follow that exact uh, same same path that they that they did. So look for opportunities and, and go do unique things. There's any number of opportunities out there. Uh, and uh, we just want people to take full advantage of that. And I would say... You know the the thing I would I, I would tell our great service members and and quite frankly their fam families as well um, is that we really value you know your contribution to the organization uh, we really value uh, you know I have a deep respect for our traditional guardsmen it's so much more difficult to be a guardsman a traditional guardsman today than it was forty years ago when I when I enlisted uh, the demands that we have on you the demands the army has on you uh, and quite frankly the demands our governors have on on their state national guard significantly higher than than they were in, in 40 years ago and fully understanding that we're only able to serve uh and we're only able to have careers in 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 the army national guard because of the love and support of our families and the support of our employers and so you know i just and joshua you're you're a great example of that you know i just really deeply value your contribution to the organization and the fact that you would go back and forth uh, from from here to Missouri to take you know to to ensure that you had that experience as a company commander, I think uh, speaks a lot about about you and a lot about what our modern guardsmen are willing to do. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks for coming on the program and thanks for taking the time. I appreciate all the advice and and information that you shared here today. So. You bet, absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joshua. If you would like more information on any of the topics discussed today 
please visit our social media pages in the links below or search Leaders Recon on any of your favorite platforms. If you liked today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.